field introduce Dr. Margaret Singer to you, and I just want to uh, take just a moment or two uh, to add a personal note before I really introduce her. I left the particular cultic group that I was in in uh, the fall of 1978, and at the time I subscribed to Psychology Today. So six months later, or even less, I got my newest edition of Psychology Today in the mail and read coming out of the cults. And that was my first introduction to Margaret Singer. And I read that and I thought, boy, that describes me to the T. The trouble is, I wasn't in a cult. <laughs> Nevertheless, I never forgot the article, and I never forgot what she said. And even as I did my dissertation, I uh, uh, did my dissertation in 1983 at the University of Pittsburgh, and I referred to Margaret Singer's article describing what I was seeing in other religious groups, exactly what was going on in cults. Here I had my doctor, and I still had not totally put the whole thing together. But uh, that was my own personal initial connection. And then when I finally found out about the Total Awareness Network, two years after I received my doctor, it was such a wonderful privilege and honor to be able to meet Dr. Margaret Singer, one of the few psychologists in the nation that has uh, understood the cult phenomenon and has been able to take a stand. So in, in many ways, Margaret has been a personal role model for me. And, in ways that she doesn't know of personal support for me. For some of the background, Dr. Margaret Singer received her doctorate degree in clinical psychology from the University of Denver. She is an emeritus professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and an emeritus professor at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. She is also an adjunct professor of psychology at the California School of Professional Psychology and has been doing research and practicing psychotherapy for more than 45 years. She has testified as an expert witness in court on behalf of parents trying to remove their children from the cult. She has sided with cult victims against the cult leader in many court cases, three of whom have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. She received the National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Award and has received numerous research awards. In fact, just last night in Dallas, Texas, the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists awarded her a distinguished lifetime Research Service Award just last night in Dallas, Texas. She has served as the president of the American Psychosomatic Society and as a senior psychologist at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and as an advisory editor of professional journals. She authored the widely read Coming Out of the Cults, which I had said was published in January of 1979 in Psychology Today. I could go on and on and on. She is truly one of the original, and thank goodness, one of the best cold busters around. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very good to be back again at a uh, CAN conference. And I will just pick up what Paul said. That article that I wrote in 1979, if you don't have a copy of it, get a copy because it's just as useful today as it was in 79 because the content of the programs uh, is pretty much uh, predictably the same. Now, what I want to talk about today, they wanted to focus put upon uh, recovery from mind control and what some of the issues are. And um, I brought my clock along. After teaching 45 years, you always bring your own clock. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of places just never buy clocks or the walls. <laughs> now, across the 
years that I've been interested in studying cults, and usually for groups like this, I study cults purely from a professional standpoint. None of my relatives have been in cults. My daughter was going to punch a cultist out one day on the <laughs> University of California campus because she was studying for a chemistry exam. And she recognized this fellow as a recruiter for one of the large cults that uh, her mother was not too happy about. And this young man came up and started trying to recruit her to go home to dinner at his international living place. And she told him, get away. She was studying for exam. She moved to a second bench out in the plaza area at UC Berkeley. This same recruiter came over and she said to him, I told you once. You leave me alone. If you bug me again, I'm going to call the cops. She moved to a third bench. The recruiter for said large cult comes over the third time. She threw her chemistry book down. She jumped up and she said, I told you to leave me alone. I told you I was going to call the cops. Now I'm going to punch you out. <laughs> She had an attitude, and uh, she was on the university women's heavyweight rowing team. Uh, so our whole family has been very interested in this whole area of keeping people in a democratic society in a position to enjoy the benefits and participate in a democratic society. Now, what have been the trends across time in the cult studying business. As you realize, the very first wave of cults we all saw and worked with were youth cults. Then as time moved on, the recruiting was done of people of all ages, including cults, into cults couples and whole families. In addition, the variety of contents as well as the variety of ages spread. And we saw that we were working not just with individuals who were in culty groups, but that when people came to emerge, sometimes they emerged as couples, or a part of a family would come out, or a whole family would come out. Now what we're getting so many calls about are people calling for help in custody issues, because one member of a family is still back in the uh, group. Yes. yes. Would it interrupt you too much to change where, where you'll have a mic? Let's do it. We're okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I think yeah. here we're all happy. Yeah. 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 Thanks very much. Yes, ma'am. Back here we can't hear in the back. We would like. We've got the door open here. We can't hear. Move the chair to the front. We don't have to the front if we can hear. All I can do is keep moving closer. I have to have a person running up and down the aisle. Preach it. Okay. I'll just belt it out a bit louder from here. If you maybe you sit in the middle of the room and help. I'll put you on a rotating thing, you know. You're on the aisle. You're on the aisle. So that the custody issues have become very important issues that are coming into all of us that are studying the effects of cults on our society. And a number of hospitals are starting to call because of the number of therapists who seem to be getting into peculiar interactions uh, with their clients and developing lots more multiple personalities and lots more uh, ritual abuse survivors, apparently, so that we need to be very careful, very calm, very sane about evaluating certain of the trends that are going on in the uh, study of cults. Um, the classes of returnees from cults need to be looked at. Now, what we're talking about here today is recovery from mind control, recovery from having been in any kind of a thought reform program. You see, the reason I'm most interested in keeping focused on what are the psychological and social techniques that are used to induce people to join groups to change their behavior and maintain them as members, and then for all of us that work in the rehab 
of people who have come out of intense, closed, totalistic groups to have a much more pinpointed and useful series of procedures and contexts for people who emerge from cults. So that the returnees are not just from cults, we work with returnees from thought reform programs, of social influence programs of various kinds. So they come not only out of cults, but out of large group awareness training programs. And the large group awareness training programs are now starting to infiltrate the training programs for business and industry. And then there is the whole area of abusive church groups. And there's really good news. Dr. Ronald N. Roth has a book that will be out about the end of February or the 1st of March, and it's being titled Churches That Abuse. And I reviewed it for his publisher, and it's well worth looking for. And he focuses on churches that abuse. And often they are also small startup groups where mind control and thought reform uh, techniques are being used. So that all of us interested in working with people who are trying to free themselves from the effects of these intense indoctrination programs in totalist groups must, I think, open our uh, methods and doors to people coming from slightly wider range than just cults. <coughs> Now, all of these above people I just listed off that are coming out of cults, large group awareness training programs, abusive churches, and abusive charismatic groups. I'm not implying that churches per se are abusive, and I'm not saying charismatic groups are abusive. <coughs> Those who are, are. And I really always want to emphasize this because some of the large major cults who are very mad at me because I've testified on behalf of people suing them, uh, would like to pin on me that I am an anti-religious, anti-many things person. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so that what I'm saying today is pointed toward all of us working with people who are emerging from high control, intense, closed, totalistic groups. Now, there's a wide range of issues for people when they come out of these groups. The first stage and problem that almost anyone has, no matter the duration of time they've been in a group, is they find themselves in what the sociologists call a state of anomie, meaning when you have had certain belief system and you're no longer in that belief system, and you're in this period of emerging, what is it best called? And since we already have a term called anomie, it refers to that problem all people exiting from totalistic groups have. Namely, when they come out of the group, they have three different value systems that have to be integrated and reconciled. The value system that they took with them into the cult the value system that they were taught while they were in the group, and those two systems of values must be reconciled with the third one, namely the current situation. So this state of anomie that we see in people coming out of totalist groups is this state of being in which the person mentally and emotionally is very busy, very occupied with how to deal with beliefs and values from three different periods, and often three somewhat conflicting sets of values. Secondly, people coming out of totalist groups are having to deal with confusion about causality, <coughs> and confusion about philosophy. So there's this state of anomie of trying to reconcile three different philosophies, and also a stage of real and concomitant confusion 
in the emerging person's mind. We're coming to see as a consequence of being in mind control groups, many of what psychologists call cognitive inefficiencies. That's an abstract term meaning when people come out of groups where they've spent hours, days, months, and years doing empty mind mantra meditation, lots and lots of chanting, lots and lots of hyperventilation, hours, days, months, and years uh, doing past lives types of uh, work in certain groups. When these people come out, they look just like all of us in this room bright eyed, healthy, regular folks. But when they describe to me the problems that are going on inside their head, these are best called cognitive inefficiencies, meaning these people oftentimes, as smart as they are, as educated as they are when they went into the cult, because of numerous things that have happened while they were in the group, they have tremendous trouble studying, concentrating, reading books and getting any meaning at all. Some of the most impaired people have been in groups where over and over and over they were trained to break up reflective thought. When they come out, they look just like all the rest of us, but inside their head, every time they try to get a straight, sequential reasoning going in their mind, these patterns that got built in during the time in the cult interrupt so that it's very hard for them to concentrate. It's very hard for people coming out of these groups to get a sense of planning ahead, a sense of motivation, a sense of self-agency that they are directing their lives because inside their head, and I can see so many of you nodding, you know what I'm talking about. You try to make a plan of what you're going to say to someone sitting next to you. You look at them, you smile, and say hello, and have lost the rest of the plan. And it gets very tiring when you first come out, coming to realize that a lot of people get very concerned. They think their mind has turned to mush or something horrible has happened. And uh, I want to assure you the mind has not turned to mush and it's going to get back to the way it used to be. And the reason that I'm always uh, up here flagellating most traditional therapists is people coming out of totalist groups don't need psychotherapy, they need education and information. Wow. Somebody has to help them learn what was it that happened that changed the way their mind and works? What is it that's causing these floods of emotion for no good reason that just pour up into your awareness? So we have the anomie, the confusion, the cognitive inefficiencies, but we also have a fourth kind of domain of problems, namely emotional and state of connectedness problems. When you come out of a totalist group where a lot of mind control programs and what most of you are so aware of has been the way in which you learn to adapt, to stop doing critical thinking, to stop reflecting on what you're doing, to just focus on the program that you're in, there's a thing that psychologists and psychiatrists call dissociation gets learned which means you learn to split off your emotional connectedness to your own ideas and your emotional connectedness to the people around you. So after coming out of some of these groups, what the exit counselors used to refer to as floating is one part of this broader phenomenon that has the floating really technically is a part of the anomie. The floating is a part of dissociation, of splitting off emotions from mental contents. And the floating also, for some people, is the unintentional meditation, the unintentional state 
of popping back and feeling that their mental state is just like it was when they were in this world. Next, people emerging from totalist groups are bringing what is best called developmental lags. That is, their education, their career, their finances is much behind where they are age-wise. Okay. Now, and kind of, if I've lost track of the numbers, I have a seven here, and it may not be so, because uh, I write my speeches on my way to my meetings. So that, <laughs> you, know, you may have had to transfer planes in St. Louis, and you were at five, and you start. <laughs> 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 the next one is a person coming out of a totalist environment needs a recovery from what I call aversive conditioning. People coming out of certain groups are very aversive to eating meat. You get somebody that's been in Ananda Marga or almost any of the vegetarian groups of any persuasion, depending upon the intensity of the aversion to eating anything other than vegetables, these people in some of the groups really are almost ill physically at the smell of fish, chicken, meat, and you need to work with families about how are you going to have meal preparation and so on because the aversions to foods can be extraordinarily strong. The aversions to people in general that are not members of the little group you were in. When you come out of a group you've been taught to think people that were non-members of your elitist group are lesser beings and that you're to act negatively toward them. People coming out of, for example, Church Universal and Triumphant have learned a certain color coding. And if you're a grandparent and you show up in black, brown, red clothing and the kids scream and cower behind the chair, it's your clothing color because they have a certain series of acceptable <laughs> colors, and those of you that are ex-members can fill in far better than I. So aversions to the clothing, the color, the food. Also, most people coming out of the modern-day college groups are aversive to checking into good medical, dental, and psychological care because as part of retaining them in the group, the cult leader does this divide and separate stuff of saying regular medicine is bad, regular psychology is bad, dentists are a bunch of bums, uh, you name it. If they're outside the group, avoid them. And uh, those of you that haven't read the uh, recent uh, exposés in the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, do look into that one. And there's a lot of focusing there on how people are taught to avoid and not seek proper medical uh, care when they come out of these groups. Do you remember, I think it's the October 3rd JAMA. October 2nd JAMA, just now. It's, yeah, go to the library and Xerox it. It's very helpful. And yeah, talk with Patrick Ryan. Harvard. Yes, sir. They're trying to find if they have a large pile of them right outside. Oh! Bring them in. <laughs> right, see, it looks like what David Clark like is holding up. Okay, Pretty people man. coming out of many groups have been taught to be aversive to standard, civilized healthcare practices. Coming out of most of the high control groups, They've been taught that education is to be avoided. Why? In order to really be controlled, the cult leader wants to keep people in hand, in the group, and separated off from values in the outside society. And then a problem that comes on emerging from the groups is a fear of getting involved with any other group that might control you as much as you've just been in control. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about the difference between consultation and therapy. Most, and I give talks all over, and I've been giving them for years, 
And uh, quite a few mental health professionals are really getting the notion that they do have to cooperate with ex-members, with parent groups, with CAN, with various local affiliates to learn about different cults and not think that everyone that has come out of a cult is some mental case. People coming out of cults, the cults are very snobbish. <laughs> with problems. And they selectively and neatly avoid getting people in that look to them like, quote, well, mental health problem people. <laughs> they don't want them. They're too hard to manage. You know, they wander off instead of chopping the vegetables. <laughs> 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 now, one of the large international cults that has a big uh, base in uh, the Oakland, Berkeley area, one time got so desperate, they called and asked, would I come over and consult about this one lady they had? Mm. She oh. was as schizophrenic as anybody one ever sees. And you know what the problem was? She wouldn't chop the back. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the thing was the uh, leader at that group, at that particular facility, realized that I really could be of some help. Parents, relatives, spouses, brothers, sisters, who are seeking help from you need information and need education, not any consultation. See, consultation, clear since the days of old Rome and Latin men, you get people together who have knowledge to help you make a program or plan to cope with a problem outside of yourself, some kind of dealing with an outside force. Therapy or treatment is from the medical model that something's the matter inside. Lots of former cultists need to see a good physician, a good psychiatrist, a good psychologist, a good mental health professional, a social worker. But also, foremost, they need information about how it was that they were changed, why did they stay, and so they don't keep on thinking there's a big defect in them for two reasons. People coming out of cults feel very defective because usually while they were in the cult, they were made to feel that there were a great number of things wrong with them because most cults are always harping on perfection. All of us humans, the best we can do is to just try so that you can't be in a cult and not continually fail. So that when you come out of a cult, you've had this long period of forever failing and not living up enough. Mm -hmm. And having been sort of squelched in various ways by management. And then you come out and you start meeting and talking to regular folks, and you then start blaming yourself. There must be a defect in the self why did I join? Why did I stay? So there's a second set of beratings, the one that the guru put upon them or the leader, and then after exiting, there must be a defect in me. If you start traditional therapy with the person and assume that there is a defect in them right at the start, you're just going down the wrong pathway. Consultation education. If after the people are out functioning in the community, doing well, they then want therapy, that means you will focus on things within them that they want to talk about and see about change. Now, I fuss at therapists say that often they bypass the whole time the person was in a cult because as therapists, they simply don't understand about cults, they don't understand about thought reform programs and so on. And their own ignorance causes them to take care of their own anxiety by just not talking about their time in the cult and just jumping back to what they know how to do. 
and a lot of therapists, I'm sorry to say, have sort of a one method of therapy. And if your needs don't fit, they don't send you on, but they try applying the one method. And therefore, seek motivations within the ex-cultus as to why he or she sought out the cult. Well, all of you here know you did not go searching for brand X cult. <laughs> <laughs> they found you. You saw their ad. You didn't go searching for somebody that was going to cause you to abandon your family, your education, your career. You didn't go out looking. You may have been looking for something altruistic for friends or something good in your life. But you weren't out looking to be uh, for 17 years in Brand X group. So that um, ordinary therapy tends to assume a motivation for the joining that had something to do with dependence. Mm. Could you repeat that? Yes. Yes. Ordinary therapy tends to assume some motivation on the cultist part to seek out the organization because of dependency. And we just talked about the fact that cults are very <coughs> recruiters. And you all, those of you that are long established members of this group, have talked so much about all. Um, the fact that people that get involved with cults tend to be pretty average, normal, regular people. They are not a group of mental health casualties when they go in. Some of them are when they come out. But fixably so. The self-esteem has been shattered, as we've already said. And traditional therapy can regress people. And see, they've just come out of a group that regressed them and made them act like children of the guru, children of the leader. So that all of the counseling that most exit counselors do and the people that do really effective work with former cultists and people that have come out of North Reform programs focuses on helping people understand and get self-educated about how it all came about. And try not to let them regress. Try not to let them get dependent on the therapist and the exit counselors and so on. Um, so what people emerging from cults really need is information and help in breaking the ties that they were led to assume. Now, when people come out of cults, they're very hypersensitive, mm -hmm. hypersensitized to two things. Recognizing anger <coughs> and recognizing possible rebuffs from other people. Mm -hmm. Recognizing anger. When you're working with someone, I find, that's been in a cult a long period of time, to survive in the cult, one has to become very astute at reading nonverbal expressions and attitudes and taking the smallest verbal cue and avoiding getting in trouble with the guru, the leader. And when people come out as a counselor, a helper, unless you're very aware that because you have a headache and you've got a grumpy look, the ex-cultist is going to be very sensitive, very aware, and try to start modifying their behavior, thinking that you're frowning, you're grumping at something they've done, because they, for years, have changed their conduct in response to little minimal cues from other people. So do be aware of how hypersensitized the exiting all cultists is to recognizing anger and possible rebuffs 
from other people. Another problem with certain <coughs> individuals is that they're underexperienced in dealing with conflict. While they were in the cult, they could not disagree. They could not argue with management. They weren't supposed to bicker and argue at all. So that in spite of the fact that when they went in, they were a pretty ordinary 17 or 25 or 35 or 50 year old. When they come out, they had a prolonged educational and conditioning experience not to engage in disagreement, not to engage in any form of conflict. So when they come out of the group, they get very alarmed at hearing family members, anybody, engage in ordinary debate mm -hmm. at all. Any arguments they feel are almost exaggerated situations. And just simple differences of opinion are sensed by the former cultists as a major conflict. And one of the things that's been interesting is having ex-cultists in courses I've taught in Berkeley, in which some poor ex-cultists would come to me after class and she or he would be so alarmed at the fact that there was diverse opinions about what the course was about. That someone was saying that, gee, they liked books so and so much better than articles, so and so, and we evaluate what was good, what was bad. The ex cultists would be very concerned and need to check how did I feel about it? How did the other people feel in the group? Because they were so aware that all that time they were in the group, they hadn't heard honest differences of opinion and dissecting reasoning and so on in a public forum. And they think it's warfare. Like some of you may have some opinion that Brand X cult is really a fine bunch of people and that I'm just wrong about it. Okay, I'll hear your story. You'll hear mine. Unless you're with Brand X. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, uh, many people are very hypersensitized to anger, potential revolves, and to avoiding any kind of conflict and seeing the smallest of conflict exaggerated. However, there are a few people who exit from high confrontation groups, people that have been in Synanon and what's left of Synanon, and a few cultic groups that have taken the Synanon approach of high confrontation, gaming, attack, ways of dealing within the group. When they exit from high confrontational groups, and a lot of the ones that some of you that deal with people who are exiting from large group awareness training programs where they have been led by the group to become aggressive confrontational salespeople to get as many people to buy the weekend seminar as possible. They need help in getting more aware of the fact they are too confrontational, too heavy sell, hard sell, from the days in the cult. They are in the minority and they come from usually synonym clone type, sort of pseudo drug rehab centers that are more cult like than uh, rehab centers and uh, who have come out of some of the new age uh, large group awareness seminar trainings. Now, since I've been giving the mental health professionals a few tweaks here and there, I now will tweak the clergy a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so many uh, people, when they come out of groups, I've worked with a huge number of people who have come out of groups where the leader of the group said, you will marry him, and you will marry her. Her name is Mary, you're John, you're a pet. Okay, they come out, they're in the process of getting divorced, or they've already divorced, and they go around to the standard clergy of their 
past. And the clergy man or woman cannot understand because he or she is not up with what's going on in public organizations. And the poor person literally <coughs> doesn't make a good contact. And those of us that are in the helping of ex-cultist business have to get a whole lot of clergy people that are available in different parts of the country that will help people sort out what happened to them, how to explain it, and how to find someone of the religious group that they're wanting to be affiliated with to understand and help them deal with what has to be worked out with and um, one time there was a large number of people all emerged from a group called Witness Lee. Mm -hmm. All that one big batch of them. And many of them had been one of these, you John and you Mary, uh, are a uh, to be red couple. And uh, some of those people I had to really put more time in helping them find clergy that would talk with them about what they wear and so on. Um, so all of the clergy that come in these meetings are well aware and are at the top of helping people get reconnected with any type of group they want to reaffiliate with. But if all of you can sort of help educate your pastors back in your home areas, and ones who may be seeing our video. We have to know. I'll just look at the notes. Oh, I'm going to talk just a touch because we're all having to deal a lot more with children and teenagers who have been reared in cults and who have been coming out the last few years. In working with these youngsters, it's helpful to work with their parents so the parents go to the schools, to pastors, whoever, and help the adults come to understand that the children have been taught to dislike non-members of the group that they were in, as well as relatives. So that I've had to work with lots of people, helping them get children to reconnect with grandparents, with aunts, uncles. Also, children raised in cults, often when they come out, have to have almost instant instruction that some of the political attitudes they learn while in cults just do not go over well in the outside world. I've been working with some children that have come out of the Alamo Foundation. And if you want to get your little head knocked off, you come out of that group and go into a public school system where you tell the Catholic children, the black children, the Jewish children, all of the myths about Mr. Alamo's attitudes toward certain groups in our society. And when the children coming out of this particular group go to school and try to convince the teacher and the other children at school that there is this big conspiracy between the Pope the CIA and the United States Postal Service. The <laughs> <laughs> last one that always gets the last. But that is part of what these poor kids are becoming the neighborhood pariahs. Children that come out of being reared in the children of God, you need to work with their parents instantly about talking about letting the kids know freely what their value system was before they went into yeah. children of God, and then say that the things that were done while we were in the group are not done out in the larger world, and there are certain things that must stop. 
so that all kinds of consultation with children and teenagers. And there are a number of small nomadic cults starting up again. And some of these are getting a large number of single mothers with their kids into these nomadic groups so that a lot of parents, primarily dads, are coming around to all kinds of agencies and helping sorts to find out how they can possibly ever locate the kids. The FBI law enforcement people say, trying to find a kid that's been taken underground in the US by some of these nomadic small cults is extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible. Also, we're getting lots of calls from um, divorced families or split families where the cult leader has sent the children and the parent that's still in the cult to faraway places, primarily into Asian countries and into Latin countries and all so on. When children come out of many of the cults, they're very behind in medical, dental, glass evaluations, whether they should have glasses or not, behind in their education. Most children coming out of the cults today are ill-trained to relate to the diverse world that we all relate to. This is a very diverse society. It is diverse in terms of religion, economics, uh, races. It is a democracy of diversity. We need many, many different diverse groups. And when children come out of these elitist cultic groups, as counselors, we need to help their parents right away start talking about the value system <coughs> of an egalitarian democratic society that we all must live in. Um, and working with teenagers, because a lot of teenagers are, once they get out of the cult or the charismatic group, so rebel that they're really a danger to themselves because while they were in the cult, they have not really been informed about AIDS, various sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, drugs, and uh, alcohol, and so on. So a number of these teenagers that just burst away from their families, <coughs> leave the cults, and uh, really rebel, are really at high risk. Then some teenagers, and when you're working with whole families, remember some teenagers have totally identified with the cult leader and his dogmatic authoritarian ways. And after a while, they start putting their parents' authority down because, see, the only authority while they were in the cult was the cult leader. The whole group emerges from the cult, and these teenagers have identified with the heavy-fisted, high-controlled person and saw their parents put down. And as counselors and as parents, you need to start thinking, how do you deal with your own teenagers and establish your rightful role vis-a-vis -vis them as parents in the broader society. Um, and also, children and teenagers coming out of cults are way <coughs> behind other kids of their age in learning that we all <coughs> have to make compromises. We have to learn how to do agreed upon things and how to sort of mediate differences. And they will not have had as much skill in the resolution of conflicts as the educational and social class background of their parents would cause you to expect those children would have seen. Because while those parents and the kids were in the cult, the parents did not get to demonstrate sensible, ordinary conflict resolution methods within a family. 
And I think we need more exit counseling available for those of you that do exit counseling to work with the children and teenagers a lot more and get the programs really focused around working with some of the young ones. Now, I just wanted to fill that sort of update of some of my thinking since last we met last year and now open it up for questions, comments, answers. Yes, sir. Dr. Singer, I have a two part question, if I may. Uh, the first part is how often have you seen that therapist? misdiagnose an ex cultist as being psychotic or schizophrenic, put on Haldol or some of other drugs, and then told that he, he or she has an organic problem. And then the second part of my question is, what can we as ex cultists do to convince the mental health professionals who are so close to the idea that thought reform is such a serious issue? Yes, this man is not one of them that's out picketing us, probably. This is a real psychologist. <laughs> okay, yes, I have seen a number of people who were put on uh, major tranquilizers, halidol, etc., stellar speed, and whatnot, because the content of their cult experiences sounds so strange. I don't see some of the people here that you know I've worked with over the years. There are a lot of people that come out of TM and other prolonged <coughs> meditation, chanting, hyperventilation groups who have some of the strangest dissociative states with visions in them. These people are not hallucinating in the sense that schizophrenics or organic people are hallucinating. They have learned a kind of accommodation. It takes me a whole number of minutes to explain that people that have been in those prolonged meditation states are not, quote, insane, and they're not hallucinating. And I just talk with these folks about because I know how from day one of staring at a candle in many of these ceremonies and being, without being told, but being tranced out by the mode of chanting, they use a voice like I do now. The combination, and I don't think the person's here that's got one of the best stories of the progression of the orange flame of the candle. A very bad initial experience with meditation and being tranced out. And the more this person spoke to management at the cult, the more the cult told him or her, meditate more. And the more this person did it, the more they felt dissociated the more they thought about that very first experience of the orange plate in the candle. And in time, this person was telling people after they had exited from the cult that there was an orange fog between them and the real world with deities in it. This sounds really quite bad. I've heard these kinds of stories so often and what you do is you go back with the person and let them tell you when they first became aware of it, what were the circumstances, who are these little deities in the orange fog. It's not orange fog like comes in across the bay in San Francisco. It's the mental processing of staring at orange flames and candles, all kinds of compounding of the experience of hyperventilating over breathing for prolonged periods of time and so on. So that some people do get put on Haldol and major medications because their stories sound so weird. There are a few people who are psychotic when they come out of the group. Psychiatrists that get good consultation 
from somebody that knows about cults can do a real good interviewing and talking and help the physician, the psychiatrist, and the cultist. What was the second part? Yes, people get misdiagnosed as crazy that are really telling you some of the weirdest experiences. People that do a lot of past life uh, auditing in one of the groups have a lot of trouble not slipping into one of those roles that they spent thousands and thousands of dollars working on developing. And so when they start sharing with their therapist that. The second part the, was what? The second part was how can we as ex cultists influence or persuade the mental health association society that's out there uh, that thought reform is really such a serious issue that it is because for example, one of my best friends was involved in the Boston movement. He has now left, and he's he's still attending the Church of Christ. It's a traditional Church of Christ. Yeah, the regular. Right, and that's fine. However, all the trigger mechanisms are there. He doesn't see the point of my point of he needs to de church or go to some other church or what have you. But the counselor that he is seeing is is, is a good one. However, he thinks it's an organic problem versus, well, you know, cult mind control really doesn't exist. And, you know, someone who is not hypnotized would not do something under hypnosis, you know, which you know that's hogwash. Yeah. Um, how can we as ex cultists influence the uh, mental health? My uh, answer right? is very slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really just all have to keep at it. What help would a two-year-old coming out of a cult be? A two-year-old, a mother and a father. <laughs> a kid at that age, even if they've been molested, you know, if they've been in one of those groups and stuff, the sooner the parents start just getting embedded in the reality of now, Drop all that stuff and look forward in life and look forward in doing normal stuff and deal with your guilt elsewhere than in your parenting because of taking the kid in or having the kid in that group. So just be a good parent, get focused in now and drop stuff. Okay, in the children of God, hordes of teenagers, 14 and up, are running away, leaving their parents behind. They are without a pre cult personality and without family or friends. Where do you start with rehabilitation and recovery? How can we get them assimilated into society? This is a real issue. They have just that cult experience. And literally it's as if you're getting someone that just came out of prison because they have to learn so many different things. And this is a really difficult uh, scene. I don't know, you know, in general, you have to know who in the outside world is caring for these teenagers. Are they in shelters? It's very complicated, but this has happened to a number of cultic groups when the teenagers get to be big enough that they can actually run away, they do. And that's a healthy thing, anyway. Right, it's a healthy thing in a way, but they're without the support that a person of their age needs. We all have to think about this one, because this is rough in terms of some of the cult uh, experiences. <clears throat> is it possible after 10 years to, exi to exit a husband? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't read well. Is it possible after 10 years to exit counsel a husband and wife and two young children out of a destructive group? What is the best way to go about it? Planning. You have to get a hold of some of the exit counselors that are very, very experienced. Talk with them and see about what experience have they had. My experience has been you cannot get two people in the same room and try to exit counsel them, get one in one room and one in another room and talk with them. Why? Because
because they've been taught for years to keep reinforcing mm -hmm. what they learned in the group. So that I've interviewed about 97 exit counselors. Some of you haven't even met each other that are in the exit counselors. And the phenomenon of not doing it as a big group has went widely conveyed to me. And where I got the notion myself before I tried working with ex exiting families and stuff was of all the people, of all the Westerners, who had been subjected to the thought reform program as civilian prisoners in mainland China, the only two people where the thought reform program didn't wear off real fast was a husband and wife pair who had been incarcerated, thought reform, and repatriated together. And last I heard, they're still uh, talking the uh, line that they learned. So that David, yes. After you finish, Margaret, could you make the distinction between what an exit counselor is by definition and a traditional counselor? Oh, exit. Why don't we do that now? Exit counselors are people, usually themselves having been in a cult, and it's an apprenticeship training. Several, oh, back in the late 60s was when I first started meeting what the cults used to call the programmers. Only the cults have used that term for years. An exit counselor, in my definition, is a person who knows a tremendous amount about all different kinds of cults, is a real authority on how thought reform programs and social influence works. They have usually a tremendous library of literature on many, many cults, a tremendous library on thought reform programs, and many good videotapes because exit counselors are literally educators working with people who are reconsidering whether they want to stay in or come out of a group. Regular quote counselors is a generic term for people who counsel you in high school, college, uh, who you go to when you're feeling depressed, the usual mental health people. And I'm sort of fussing with them today because they don't know enough about cults, they don't know enough about the programs that people have been exposed to. And I know some of you who are here, I know very well, who are trained therapists, as well as people who work in exit counseling. So I'll uh, talk to some of them. Was that useful, David? OK. Um, so on the whole, the answer to trying to deal with a husband, wife, and two young children, talk with some of the exit counselors that are here, and you can't, on the whole, easily do it as a group, because the whole thought reform program has caused them to keep reinforcing each other, reinducing guilt, and it's very difficult. But one at a time, it works. Now, I'll try to be democratic and go through this. I am a recent ex-member of a Bible-based cult. In my group, we were taught aversion to psychologists and to the idea that the church was a cult. As a result, the other ex-members I know are closed to accessing help from psychology or can. How can I help allay these aversions so they can get this help? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the most remarkably poignant things is when your friends see you're surviving. Mm -hmm. Not only surviving, you're thriving. <laughs> and when they comment, hey, you look real healthy, you look real good, and you've got a job or you're back in school, that's when you say to them, hey, would you like me to sort of tell you about how I did it? Then you tell them how you did it, and then say to them, I have some friends who might be someone you would rather talk to than me. But you use your own surviving and thriving. And, you know, unless you're going to become a full-time exit counselor, and there are there's such a need for people to help. So good luck and keep working at it. <laughs> you spoke about aversion to others. 
food, education, and so forth. Could you speak about the aversion to your own emotions and yourself? How do you break that cycle? In addition, this cycle of sensitization to anger and rebuff needs to be broken. How? It takes quite a while. And see what this person is saying, the aversion to your own emotions. You see, while you were in the cult, you would have been discredited. You would have suddenly lost all status. If you were in certain groups, you could have been sent almost to a penal colony division of that cult. If you let your emotions show, that is, if when they said you couldn't go home because your grandmother was dying, if you burst into tears, you were at the bottom of the ladder. Or if you showed anger, so that you have been, while you were in the cult, taught to split off and not let your emotions be normally experienced. So that you don't want to just suddenly have a binge of emotion, but start thinking to yourself, when do I feel righteous annoyance? Mm. When do I feel righteous satisfaction? You know, when you just wash the bathtub and it really glistens. <laughs> righteous satisfaction. <laughs> I said chopped vegetables. <laughs> you see, your own self-talk, and we all have mind chatter going on. Get your own mind chatter going of, I did do that very okay. It's all right to have a certain amount of annoyance. It's all right to look at flowers and really feel happy. Start labeling emotions that you can handle and have them be low-level pleasure, low-level anger and annoyance, low-level satisfaction. Don't just try to burst forth and, you know, punch out the recruiters in the plaza. And so <laughs> but step out of the see, when you're out after a while, you will have gotten so your own emotions don't scare you and you get that practice you used to have of controlling and modulating your own emotions. And how to break the cycle of sensitization to anger and rebuff. Again, time is what helps and your own mind chatter of saying, look, as I say, with the cults hating me, all I need is about 37% of the people to vote for me. I could be president of the United States. <laughs> You don't have to have everybody just in you. That's right. They cannot wither you with words, dirty looks, uh, smear tactics, and so on. So that start thinking to yourself in your own mind chatter that you are an okay human being. And just a step at a time, don't try to spring back and get down on yourself if it takes quite a while. I once did a survey of how long does it take people to recover from floods, fires, divorce, bereavement. Study after study, two years plus. So I say to people, it's not guaranteeing it's going to take you two years to get over Grand X Gulf. But don't even bug yourself till about that amount of time's gone by. <laughs> Give yourself all that time to a step at a time to work on your inner spirit. Oh, they're going to pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> what about children who get involved in cults and get out as adults? Do they regress back to being the child they were before they got in? No. They just have sort of lacunae. They have holes in their skills. Wow. They have developmental lags. And if you're the parents, you can help them catch up. If you're uh, helpers of another kind, uh, they're just behind schedule. It's like some kids that have been raised overseas. I know some of you are the offspring of missionaries and were raised overseas. When you come back to the US, you need a lot of practice at just catching up with how things are here. So. Uh, 
how do you improve your concentration from the thought stopping process? First of all, you become aware that it was a built in and trained ghastly habit. Don't just feel passive and think, oh my gosh, it happened again. Say to yourself, this is a bad habit that I was taught, that I paid thousands of dollars to learn a bad and debilitating habit. <laughs> feel a little righteous anger and keep on the track. That, that's all right, you go away. Okay, now, part of dealing with situations is people do have to just learn to handle whatever comes up, and when they get a hold of it, it works okay. Um, this is one where the person that wrote the longer one should talk with me. I would like to meet Now. We can't do any more because it's the end of our time and someone else gets the room and we go to lunch. Thank you once again for a good